Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wine.com Experiences. I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. Very excited that you're here to join us today because we were talking about one of my favorite places, wine regions and wines, which is Champagne. So Champagne is just this, it's a truly magical one of a kind place and wine. And while there are many that still kind of refer to any sparkling wine as Champagne, that's it's just not the case. True champagne must come from this region. It's, 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 it's this place. It's a true place. Um, and it's a beautiful spot. It's actually only less than a half percent of global vineyard land is what makes up champagne. So that's pretty small and it makes it pretty special. Um, so what makes champagne so special? So there are a number of things. Number of things. First, you have this, this spot of land here um, in northeast France. And it has a unique terroir. It, um, its soils, its aspect, its climate, again, the terroir, all of these things make it ideal for growing the traditional grapes for making champagne, which are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Also, champagne always undergoes that second fermentation, you know, that magical process that makes the bubbles inside the bottle. And so the wine is able to, to spend time on the leaves, and that leads to these small, delicate bubbles and this rich, creamy mouthfeel. Um, so we have these three wonderful champagnes to try. And if you purchase the trio from wine.com ahead of time, great, please go ahead and get them open, uh, pour them into some glassware if you can. Um, so you'll notice I have, I'm tasting mine out of a more of a white wine style glass. If you have flutes, great, go ahead and do that. But if you want to try champagne and more of that, that tulip shape, I really encourage you to do it, maybe even next to the flute because um, really great, fantastic champagne uh, is almost better when you're able to really enjoy those aromas. So if you don't have the wines, totally fine. Um, we still have them available on wine.com and you can purchase that. And this video lives on on the wine.com YouTube channel. Um, you'll also notice we're using half bottles which uh, is fantastic, still undergoes that second fermentation in the bottle, like I mentioned. Um, but half bottles are a great way to really enjoy wine without kind of going too far in, you know? It's, it's a wonderful kind of way to taste some wine and enjoy it. And champagne has so many options in half bottles and also makes fantastic gifts. Um, so the champagnes we're tasting today, these three champagnes come from three of the most iconic and quintessential houses in champagne. And they really, represent the history and authenticity of the region. And we're so excited to taste them in order. They are the Muette Chandon Imperial Brut, the Valtico Yellow Label Brut, and the Ruinard Brut Rosé. And we're so honored that we have the Chef de Cave from each of these houses joining us. And for those of you who don't know, a Chef de Cave is the cellar master, the chief blender, the winemaker kind of does it all. So it's a real honor to have three of them joining us to taste. So let us welcome them. Uh, we have Benoit Gouet from Mouette et Chandon, Didier Mariotti mm -hmm. from Valtico, and Frédéric Paniotis from Ruinard. Bonsoir, gentlemen. Bonsoir. Monsieur. Bonsoir, Gondoline. Um, merci beaucoup. Bonsoir. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're so thrilled to have you here talking about such remarkable, remarkable wine. So we are going to start tasting, and we will start with Moët et Chandon. So, Benoit, welcome, bienvenue. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your time. Uh, since Champagne is just so seeped in history, especially these three houses, I'd love to start at the beginning to talk about Maison Moët et Chandon and when it was established. Uh, Moët et Chandon has been established in uh, 1743. So 277 years ago, um, one of the oldest, not the oldest, but one of the oldest uh, uh, house of Champagne established by Claude Mouet. And at that time, the, the Mouet family had different kinds of businesses. Uh, Claude has been the first one to trade wine, let's say. And things really changed um, uh, with the third generation, with jean emile Mouet, the grandson of Claude, who really has been the visionary, who really has been the one who had the vision that the future of the, 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 the family business, let's say, was in uh, sparkling, uh, sparkling champagne. 
and Jean-Rémy decided to uh, focus all the family resources in the in the in the in the in in, in the growing uh, of grapes for champagne and in the making of wines. And uh, he has really established uh, all the bases um, in terms of uh, structure, vineyards, philosophy, uh, concept. And I, 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 I have to say that we, we still live on the legacy of Jean-Rémy Mouet. And maybe one of the, the, the greatest legacy of Jean-Rémy Mouet uh, is uh, in, the, in the vineyards that have been, uh, that, that have been established uh, generations after generations. Jean-Rémy had the intuition that uh, when at that time most uh, houses were buying wines, uh, he had, uh, he had the, the, the conviction that he had to secure the quality by owning vineyards, by owning lands. And since then, all the generations of Mouet et Chandon have continued to uh, buy uh, land and to develop the vineyards. And today we have the luxury of owning by far the largest estate in Champagne, 1,200 hectares made of uh, half Grand Cru, uh, one first premier cru, so very impressive in terms of quality, but also in terms of, uh, of diversity. And Jean-Rémy Jean also had the, the intuition that to develop um, his business, his brand, his name, he had not only to secure the quality, but to find ways to promote uh, his name. And so he started to approach the rural courts of Europe, uh, first in France, but also uh, in the UK and Russia and so, and very early he started to ship his wines internationally, uh, including including in the U in the in the USA. And Moet Chandon has been in the USA uh, since the 18th century. So we've been we we've been with you for more than 250 years. So it's a it's a it's a long loving affair between Moet Chandon and the USA. Oh, wonderful! It's like as long as our democracy so far. So yes. <laughs> and I know you have a, a beautiful property in uh, Epernay. So uh, there's there's the house there. Tell us, um, are most of your vineyards around Epernay? I was thinking about the, the terroir there versus uh, further north. Alors, we, we, we've been established in Epernay since 1743. Um, and we are still there. Uh, our, our main uh, winery is in Epernay. Even if we have inaugurated some years ago a, a second operation uh, next to Epernay, but uh, the historical site is in Epernay. But our grapes come from uh, all over Champagne. Uh, one key principle at Moëté Chandon is really to be inclusive in the sense that we want to use, uh, to use as many uh, origins within the Champagne vineyards as we can. Uh, we want to always blend uh, Pinot Noir, Meunier and Chardonnay because uh, not only they, it's, it's not only a matter of paying tribute to our predecessors who have selected these three varieties, but also because they are complementary when it comes to blending. You know, Pinot Noir bringing the the, the, the front palette, the structure, the intensity, the fruitiness, Meunier being more the, the, the fleshiness, the pulp, uh, the, the, the white fruitiness, uh, and the mid palette, and Chardonnay being more about the elegance, the finesse, the freshness, and the persistency. And at Moët Chanon, we like to play with the three qualities because we believe that when we blend, when you blend harmoniously uh, the, 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 three, the, the, the three varieties, you really create something that is more complete, therefore more harmonious, therefore more versatile. And uh, often when we ask the Moët Impérial lover the reason why they love Moët Impérial, uh, the answer, because not only it's so safe, so consistent, but also because it always delivers the pleasure, the accessibility, the spontaneity, whatever the circumstances. And for us, diversity is key. And so we like to source our grapes from our own estate, First, that is again, the largest in Champagne, uh, very high in quality, but also in diversity. And we, 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 we complete uh, our, our estate uh, with uh, contracts with, uh, with growers. And uh, at the average 2020, we had access to uh, about 278 different villages among the 319 of Champagne. So we cover about 90% of the nuances you can get from Champagne. And uh, so far, uh, I think we're the only house to have access to the 17 Grand, Fru Grand Cru. And uh, as much as 40 uh, Premier Cru out of the 44 Premier Cru. So it's very high level of quality of grape, but also diversity because we need to play with nuances. You know, Champagne is about blending. Blending is at the core of the Champagne creation. If we have come to that concept of 
blending varieties from villages, from vintages, in order to deliver a taste that is very consistent. It's because by nature, champagne is inconsistent. And the Champenois a long time ago have found that idea of keeping in reserve some wines, of playing with different villages, different vintages, different varieties to really uh, recreate year after year the same style, the same emotion. And I believe that Moëté Chandon has uh, really um, achieved the ultimate of that idea of playing with diversity in order to, to reach that idea of constancy and of uh, immediate pleasure. Yeah, I, I was going to get into that. I think you said it so well. I love the fact that you say by nature, champagne is inconsistent, but then non-vintage champagne by nature is consistent. And so you have this magic of blending to kind of, to get you there. So, so we are tasting non-vintage styles today. And, you know, I kind of wanted to explain, sometimes when I explain non-vintage to people, I explain, it's actually not non-vintage as much as it's more multi-vintage because the idea of blending these vintages so every year a house can create a consistent style so that as a consumer you have this this trust in in knowing that style that you're going to get but also an excitement of knowing what style you're going to to get so coming back to this this non-vintage moet style as you said the consistency how would you describe moet's non-vintage style first um yes you 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 you're right to say that um, Champagne is special because uh, the way we work in Champagne is so different from the other vineyards in the world. Um, we have turned constraints into, let's say, power. And, uh, and, and we have come to that idea that uh, even if uh, circumstances are challenging in Champagne, nevertheless, uh, we, we, we fight against the circumstances in order to, to, to propose what we believe uh, is, is the most challenging uh, uh, winemaking. And, uh, and, and the idea of non-vintage is really to, uh, to blend as largely as possible, to take advantage of the nuances and variations you can find uh, across the varieties, the villages and the vintages to always recreate the same quality, the same style, let's say the same pleasure, the same emotion whatever the circumstances. And in Champagne, we well, used to say that, um, obviously you can create different styles of Champagne, but ultimately you should judge the quality uh, and the potential of a, of a house in the way uh, we are able to reproduce the same style, the same emotion year after year, whatever the circumstances. Um, and, uh, and so the difference between non-vintage and vintage in Champagne uh, it's not just a question of quality, it's a question of philosophy. And often I like to, to take the example of ice skating. I think it's quite popular in the USA. Uh, in ice skating, you have compulsory figures and freestyle. Non-vintage is compulsory figures, okay? You have to do it whatever the circumstances. You know what you have to execute. The judges, the public, they know what you have to do and you are judged on how good you are in executing uh, compulsory figure. So it's rather rational. It's uh, teamwork at Moëté Chandon. It's very important that even if I am the chef de cave, so I'm the guide in a way, nevertheless, I rely on a team of about 10 winemakers, men, women uh, from different regions, different origins, different backgrounds, different sensitivities in order to be really able to approach the wine in a broader way, in a very large ways. Uh, and, and we are going to work the blend and all the details of the wine uh, up to the moment we will find a consensus among the team. And vintage champagne comes from only one single harvest and is more about freedom, is more about uh, personal interpretation, it's more about personal emotion, it's more the chef de cave uh, creation. And I will still listen to the team in order to be sure that uh, uh, I'm nourished by, uh, by the team and I don't do it. If any mistakes, but nevertheless, I, I, I won't work uh, up to the moment I find a consensus. I will keep my personal intuition, let's say, and my personal emotion uh, to the vintage. But nevertheless, if we had to keep uh, only one wine to create at Moët Chonon, that would be Moët Imperial, because Moët Imperial is our flagship since uh, 1869. It's a champagne that has been created uh, 151 years ago. So last year, we had the pleasure uh, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Moët Imperial. Uh, 
that has been created back in 1869 at a moment where Champagne was mostly sweet. And so Moet Imperial, and it was called Brut Imperial at that time, has been introduced in the market as a, one of the very first Brut in Champagne. So low in sugar, low in dosage, a, a drier style, more uh, for the aperitif and uh, for everyday celebration. Okay, well, so let's let's taste this. I'm going to taste through it and kind of talk as we taste. <laughs> if, you're, if you're still awake for tasting, um, so taste through it. Can kind of give us an idea of what to expect with that typical uh, Brut Imperial style? So first, with Moët Imperial, we really want to embody Champagne as a whole. So it's not focused on one variety, one subregion. We really want to blend Imperial at the image of the Champagne vineyards. It means that we are going to always use the three main varieties we have in Champagne. Uh, first, Pinot Noir, that is the most planted variety in Champagne. So it's going to be a large sort of Pinot Noir, 35, 40 percent. Second, Meunier, uh, that is a cuisine of Pinot Noir that is uh, quite specific to Champagne, uh, that is going to bring to our Champagne uh, uh, flesh, pulp, and a sort of a bridge between Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, uh, white flesh fruits, and a lot of um, fleshiness. Uh, for about a third. And finally, a lower third of Chardonnay, that is uh, the only uh, white fleshed uh, skin grapes of the three, because one secret of Champagne is to make white wines out of red grapes for Pinot Noir and Meunier. Chardonnay is the only white fleshed grapes, and Chardonnay is going to complete the blend with, uh, with freshness, with lightness, with elegance. But we believe at Moitié Chandon that playing with the three varieties um, in an harmonious way really help us to reach completeness. And that completeness uh, really gives to Moët Imperial that idea of versatility, that idea of being good, whatever the circumstances, to be able to, play, to, to please the plate, whatever you are looking for. Um, working with as many different villages as we can, I believe in that idea of diversity. I think that diversity brings nuances and the more nuances you have at disposal when working your blend, the more completeness you can uh, you you can craft. And that uh, that that and selling what apparel is the most blended champagne of our portfolio and maybe in champagne. And it really gives to it that completeness that again gives the versatility, that ability to to please and to satisfy whatever the circumstances. The aromatic profile of Moët Imperial will be made of, uh, let's say four colors. Uh, I believe that aromas have colors. Moët Imperial is white, yellow, green, blonde. White means uh, white flesh fruits, apple, pear. Yellow for me is about citrus fruits, uh, lemon, up to fresh uh, tropical fruits, fresh, uh, fresh pineapple. A little bit of green, a little bit of mint, that, that herbaceous character that gives the liveliness and the freshness. Uh, that's about the fruitiness. And then there is the blonde nuances, the blonde tone of Moët Imperial, that is about the maturity, an elegant maturity um, coming from the two to two and a half years of maturation on the lees, on the yeast in our cellars, that is going to develop into Moët Imperial, that kind of brioche -y, uh, slightly buttery, nutty, muesli like character that's, that is going to add complexity to fruitiness and to create uh, the broad range of aromas. But then champagne is not, uh, and wine is not about perfumes, it's about mouthfeel. So what matters the most is the mouthfeel. With Moët Imperial, we are looking for, in French, we say savoureux. Savoureux is about balancing generosity with elegance, intensity with lightness, and it's exactly what we're looking for with Moët Imperial, uh, satisfying front palate. You feel comfortable at first sip with Moët Imperial, but then progressively, you can see all the layers. You see the structure of the Pinot Noir, you see the fleshiness of the Meunier, you see the freshness of the Chardonnay, and uh, it has a very light dosage. Moët Imperial is nowadays uh, down to seven grams per liter of sugar content, what we call dosage in Champagne. So it's, uh, if not the one, one of the lowest in dosage among the Brut non-vintage in Champagne. And that gives precision, elegance, finesse, and tension to Moët, uh, to Moët Imperial. And what we're looking for today is really that balance, harmonious balance between 
generosity, pure satisfaction, and nevertheless, tension, finesse, elegance on the finish for a perfect aperitif. It is, it is beautiful. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Um, that was lovely. We are next going to be going to Vav Pico. Um, so note the pronunciation, by the way, is Vav Pico. It reminds us, rhymes with love was the trick I was told here. Um, and so Vav means widow because Vav Pico is named, uh, of course, for the widow Pico who became a widow at age 27 and took over her husband's company back in the day with being a widow and a woman and that young coming into a champagne company was, or it was other company as well. But um, Didier, I'm going to let you dive into telling the story because I'm sure you will be much better than I, but uh, I do love the story of this house. First, welcome. Thank you so much for being here, Didier. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about Maison Voptico and its history and impact on champagne and, and the world? What do we do? Oh, is Didier? You back? Just gonna drink drink his wine, his champagne wine, right? Um, while we wait, Benoit, question. Okay, I'm still here. Okay, you're still here. On on non vintage, how if somebody purchases non vintage, what is the time frame for for drinking a non vintage? I know it depends on the house. Ah. Maybe for yours. Um. Do people can they keep it a couple of years, three years, five years, ten? Um, it's well, it, it's always difficult to answer because it really depends on the the blend, whatever. Mm -hmm. But let's say that uh, I believe that um, time to enjoy champagne uh, equals the time of maturation in the cellars. So let's say mm -hmm. if a non-vintage uh, has uh, has been matured in the cellars for two to two and a half years. Uh, like Moët uh, Imperial, for instance, it means that uh, it's going to not to stay good, but to stay true to the style we have defined for the next two to three years. Voilà. Okay. Uh, a non-vintage champagne can be still good at 10 years or 20 years, but obviously with a very different styles, uh, style. And, and a vintage champagne that by the law should be uh, matured for three years in the cellars. And uh, at Moët Chambon, it's five to seven years of maturation. Uh, will be st still good to taste for the next five to ten years. So, so perfect. Voilà. Okay, merci. Didier, bienvenue. Um, thank you yeah. again so much for being here. I don't, I don't know if you uh, heard my question, but uh, we are are looking to hear hear from you. Just, I love the story of Maison Vaufico. It's just a fantastic story. So, could you tell us a little bit of that background and also that its history and the impact it had on champagne around the world. Yeah, the, the house has, was founded in uh, 1772, so nearly 250 years of history behind us. We are not the oldest house, uh, but uh, I think we are in, in Champagne for a very long time. And, and Madame Clicquot uh, has been really like an, an, an amazing woman, uh, a very bold and uh, innovating uh, woman. Uh, she she uh, unfortunately became widow at uh, the age of 27 in 1805. And uh, so veuve means widow in French. And uh, she had the courage just to, to take the reign of the house uh, at the age of 27 um, and just to develop the house to like with Moët et Chandon to buy a lot of vineyards because we believe it was very important for the house I think, oh, did he have the, oh, there we go. Yeah, I'm sorry. We have a lot of uh, troubles with the Wi-Fi in Reims. I don't know what's happening in Reims, and I think it's the same with Paul Frederic. Uh, so it's not very easy. Okay. So, yeah, we have a very strong uh, history with Madame Clicquot. Uh, she was a very bold, uh, she was an entrepreneur. Uh, she was the first to create the vintage in Champagne. She was the first to uh, imagine uh, blending red and white together to create rosé. And she also uh, was the first to uh, create the Riddling table, which was 
the, the best way to uh, to, read, to riddle the bottle and to remove the dead yeast from the bottle. So yeah. she has been very important for the house. She's still very important for the house. Um, her spirit is very important. Her motto is only one quality the finest. And it's really something which uh, inspires us uh, every day, I would say. She has a huge legacy for the house. And, and my role is really to transmit that history, that legacy to the next generation by creating uh, the yellow label every year, because it's really the base the DNA of the house. Yeah, it, it is. And it's, it's, a, it's a great story of just a lot of things that weren't typical back then. Um, of all the things that she did. So it's inspiring in so many ways. Uh, and uh, you are near France. Did I, am I saying it right? Yeah. Huh? Uh, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was taught that when I was visiting. Um, so are most of your vineyards up further north than Epernay, which is a little bit further south? Or are you, for the yellow label, do you go everywhere? I would say the 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 vineyard of the house is mostly around Reims, so Verzy, Verzenay. We have some uh, vineyard also north of the mountain, uh, Ville de Mange, Massif de Saint Thierry. Uh, but also we have a vineyard in, in, in the south of the mountain with Bouzy, Ambonnet, Aï, uh, mostly Pinot Noir. And we have some Chardonnay also in the Côte des Blancs. So that's uh, the, the, the house vineyard, I would say. Mm. But we love to also to have uh, grapes from everywhere in Champagne. Um, we are really based on, on the Pinot Noir. So we are looking for the Pinot Noir, but we, we are sourcing uh, fruits from, from all the different villages, Chardonnay, Pinot Meunier, the whole part of the blend. But our blend is mostly a Pinot Noir dominant blend, I would say. Pinot Noir is always about 45, 50% of the blend. So that's the history, the DNA of the house is about expressing the Pinot Noir with a touch of Meunier and Chardonnay. Okay, I was gonna ask you next of just, of this style. This is the, the non-vintage, people love to call it a uh, uh, yellow label as well, and um, it's well known and seen around the world. But um, thinking about just kind of that typical style, and you mentioned that it's usually almost half Pinot Noir. And is that, are you aiming for that for the richness for the body? Yeah, the idea is really to, to uh, express the Pinot Noir and you have so, so many different ways to express the Pinot Noir from the north of the mountain or from the south. So the expression is totally different, more or less maturity, more or less structure, I would say. And even the Pinot Noir from the Aube region also brings something which is very different. So we need all, all the Pinot Noir, we need Chardonnay also and Meunier to, to create that complexity. I would say the yellow label also is it, um, we 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 have we have to to taste every year about one thousand different wine from the vintage and from the reserve wine. Bertlico has one of the largest um, collection of reserve wine. I would say mm -hmm. uh, yeah. we we love to keep all our reserve wine, village by village, vintage by vintage, varietal by varietal. Uh, so it. Take us around one month, one month and a half to taste all the wine, mostly every day, 20, 25 uh, different samples. Mm -hmm. And we have that collection. And with um, the oldest reserve wine we have in the house is uh, from 1888, just to give you an idea. So we have about 25 years of, of different reserve wine from different villages that okay. create an amazing palette of, of flavors, mm -hmm. of colors we can use. And the reserve wine are about 50%, 45, 50% of the blend every year in the yellow label. Okay. And that was going to be my question. <laughs> How long does it take to taste a thousand? So is it about a month and you're going day by day to taste all of these? Yeah, uh, months, a month and a half, oh. uh, approximately. But that's okay. amazing. That's a, we are just in the middle of the tasting right now. And, and in, in one month, you have a picture of all the wine we have in the winery. Mm -hmm. We have to precisely every wine to decide how to use it where to use it if we want to keep it in the reserve wine if we want to use it in the yellow label or in the vintage so it's very intense but it's really the heart for me it's where you decide how you can create your different blend okay, well if you could taste this with us and maybe talk us through that typical non-vintage style for the yellow label fruit 
Yeah, well, I, for me, the idea of yellow label is really like when you grab a fruit from the tree uh, and you taste that fruit, you have at the same time the juicy of the fruit, but still some freshness and some acidity at the same time. Mm -hmm. So Pinot Noir is really expressing the yellow label with a lot of fruits, yellow, white fruits. Um, you have the juicy of the fruits, you have some maturity also coming, but Really, the, the vintage brings that very fresh yellow and, 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 and white fruits. And with all the reserve one we are using, then we create the complexity uh, with more mature fruits and, and also more dried fruits like nuts, like uh, brioche or so. Uh, but the reserve wine brings that complexity, that maturity in, in the blend. And also in the palette, it's really a balance between uh, strands between uh, freshness we have uh, you have the texture you have the structure and the body but at the same time it's still very crispy and, and very straight yeah it's a beautiful balance there and i just i love that the richness that this delivers every time so um my my other question that, that came in from some people who are uh, watching today was about food because a lot of people assume that, or they, they associate champagne with uh, celebration and toasting, maybe appetizers, perhaps a good cheese plate, but I've been to champagne where we drink champagne throughout the meal. I know that it does so well with food. So for people looking to see or think about starting to have champagne through a meal, do you have any suggestions on what kinds of foods might be ideal? Uh, champagne, uh is a wine of celebration, of course, and I think it's also why champagne is so successful. But if you want to see champagne as a wine first, I think it's very important also to, to use the right glass. Uh, first, we were drinking champagne in a, in, a, in, a, in a coupe, very large, then we moved to the flute. But now, if I'm looking to your glass, you are using a white wine glass more. And I think it's very important first just to, to decide which glass you want to use. Uh, a similar glass like this or a, a large glass like this one will express the yellow label in a very different way. And I think it's also a personal choice. Um, if you want to express more uh, the complexity and the body and the texture of the Pinot Noir by using a larger glass, you will get that. If you want, really want to stick on, on the fresh part of the year label, uh, then maybe use a, a glass like this will be, will be very interesting. So first, the glass, the temperature of, of, of service or so, 8 degrees, you, you keep the wine very fresh. 12, 14 degrees, you, you will go to more roundness, more texture in, in, your, in, in the mouth. So it's also very important to decide the glass and the temperature that you can pour with food. And then you have to be creative. I think it's very important just to taste and to try. Uh, maybe the Japanese food will be very interesting because they are quite very precise uh, to start with. But also some chicken, some fish uh, can be very interesting to pair with champagne. And also cheese. I like to have like an old cheese, like a Comté, for mm -hmm. example. But for me, it's more an experience. Uh, there is no one way to enjoy champagne as a wine. I think most important is to see champagne as a wine first and not only for celebration. Right. I think that's the, the best message is just look at it as a wine rather than just something, something to celebrate with. So, but that said, love to use it for celebrations also. Um, thank you so much, DDA. We are going to move into Rina. Uh, Frederic, thank you so much for, for being here and joining us. Um, when it comes to history, both of our other guests have mentioned that they're not the oldest house, and I have a feeling there's a reason behind that. <laughs> um, so, uh, Ruinar's got a good story to tell when it comes to history, so maybe you can take us back and tell us some of the history of Maison Ruinar. Well, Ruinar was indeed um, the first officially um, established Champagne House uh, back in 1729. A simple reason for that, uh, Champagne was not allowed to bottle its wine until May 1728. So basically, you know, even though it was probably existing, there was no official uh, um, commercial possibility of having a sparkling wine because you need the bottle, obviously. 
so the Renard family who were uh, into fabrics uh, decided on September 1st, 1729 to launch that business. You know, it was very small at the, uh, at the beginning. I think in 1730, we, they only sold 130 bottles, but by 1735, uh, Nicolas Renard decided to uh, dedicate uh, the company to uh, the production of sparkling, sparkling wine, champagne. Um, and, and we actually, he also, um, his son uh, who took over after him was the, the first one who uh, decided to um, uh, come to this part of Champagne, where I am now, this part of the city of Reims. I'm sitting on the cellars actually. And, and this part is called Les Crayères. We are not far away from uh, my friend uh, Didier Adbeuf Clicquot. He, he's also sitting on, on, on Crayères. And, and those, uh, those chalk peaks uh, um, are just amazing, uh, you know, to, to, store, to store the wine, to etch the wine. You, can, you cannot think of uh, better conditions uh, for storage. And they, they also happen to be uh, pretty spectacular. Um, you know, they, they, they obviously you now are part of the- uh, You mentioned they're chalk, right? Like calcium. Yeah, yeah. It, imagine like, a, like an empty pyramid. And, and this is, you yeah. know, it goes- <laughs> As low as nearly 130 feet, so 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 they're pretty deep. And obviously, you know, it, it's it's dark. Well, here there's the light, so you see the chalk. But normally, it's dark. Uh, humidity is high, and temperature is absolutely constant, uh, you know, throughout the year. So this is basically the best storage condition you can think of. And and it's totally sustainable because you don't have to, you know, uh, use air condition. Yeah, and 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 it's been around for forever, and it's. Yeah, it's exactly well, sustainable. How, how many miles for several, how much? Pardon? I'm sorry, they've been around for several hundred years. Yes, exactly. And and how many, how how long are they? How many meters? Uh, I don't know what. Renard cellars are, are only five miles, so eight kilometers, but, but okay. uh, some of what? my colleagues have longer cellars. Benoit, do you have the, which one, who has the longest cellar? Is it? Vov or Vov or is it Benoit? Uh, I don't know. I think it's British Chandon. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I was in Champagne. Well, not the oldest, but we are the longest. Five, but I mean, the worst old is Okay. All right. We've got all of our, um, what we do best. Thanks, so. <laughs> um, Sometimes size matters. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Um, so, Frederic. Champagne rosé. So I know that Renard was um, has a long history of rosé. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the evolution of rosé in Champagne? Well, um, for sure. Um, you know, uh, a, a few uh, a few years ago, uh, one of our archivists uh, just found uh, in the in the sales book in the logbook um, of Renard, dated seventeen sixty four that 60 bottles of a wine called, uh, not called Rosé at the time, but it was called Partridge Eye. Basically, it was, you know, uh, another description um, of, of Rosé. Uh, we are shipped to, uh, to the northern eastern part of Germany. And, um, and my friend Didier, uh, who is here, uh, used to be uh, claiming that uh, Clico had the, uh, the oldest Rosé, but this evidence was kind of new. And, and, and now Wenar is considered to be the first house to have made rosé. But I have to say something about Clicquot. They, they, they have the oldest evidence of uh, made in, making a rosé by blending, rosé d'assemblage, as we say. So if you ask me what the taste uh, of uh, Wenar rosé was in, in 1764, I have no idea. I'm assuming it was made by skin contact, you know, like you keep the, the skin oh, yeah. that is dark and it leaks into the juice and probably they ended up with a with a pink wine that they had to, uh, you know, sell and market, and they found the the, the pretty name of uh, Eau de Perdri. Um, and 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 later on, uh, Madame Clicquot in 1818 actually introduced the technique of blending red wine and white wine, uh, which is the technique that is probably mostly used right now in Champagne overall. Even though there are some uh, rosé made by maceration, but for we now we we uh, we are um, using this technique since the 1850s probably. So we make red wine separately from Pinot Noir grapes, and then we blend it, you know, during the during the time of blending to uh, to a blend of uh, white wines that is made from Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, uh, both to get the color right um, and and obviously the flavors as well. So it's it's the it's the fine combination of uh, of, of fine tuning uh, uh, the color, which I think is an important element. I think people, you know, the consumers like to find that quite deep color for. Uh, uh, for the Rina Rosé, 
and, and, and obviously uh, uh, the fragrance uh, that comes with it, with the addition of red wine. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting, I think, just for, for most people who understand rosé, they know that most dry rosé is not made by blending red and white. It's more about either saunier or again, skin contact with the red grapes. And for champagne, it's, it's different because you blend before that second fermentation, which, which I guess is helpful with the integration of the flavors and everything in the color. So I'd love to, uh, well, I've already tasted this, but I would love for you to talk us through tasting um, this beautiful wine. I love the color, um, but the kind of the typical flavor profile of Ruina Rosé fruit. Oh, well, yeah, talking about the color, as you can see, it's pretty intense. You really want to make a rosé that looks like rosé and tastes like a rosé. Um, and, and in terms of flavor, I think you have, you know, I, I, I was hearing my, my colleagues talking about that uh, fleshy uh, um, fruit flavors. And, and you also have this year, I think that there might be uh, other elements uh, and you don't have to go up in the tree, but more like, you know, in the bush and, and grabbing those, uh, those red berries, you know, you have some raspberry, um, some, some uh, 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 strawberry as well. But you also have, I think, a range of more like uh, tropical fruits, you know, let's say guava, lychee. So there's something a bit more um, intriguing and complex about the, uh, the nose of uh, Renaud Rosé. Mm. I like that you're going down to the, the ground, the, the berries that grow on a bush, whereas DDA was talking about those ripe fruits you pull off a tree. So it's this uh, different Up and down. Stuff. Up and down. Um, <laughs> And, and as well, you, um, I think an important part of the, of the Ruin Arsal is we try to, um, to be close to the fruit flavor. So, so we really want to have that aromatic freshness on the nose and on the palate, yet at the same time, having a palate that is quite smooth, round, accessible as well. And, and, and I think there's, there's a fine tuning that needs to be made when, when we blade the red wines um, um, so that we don't have too much of the tannic structure. This is something we don't want for, um, for Ruin Rosé. So it's a more of a softer, um, um, accessible approach, you know, on the palate. And rosé is also something to for food as well. Uh, it's a, it's a, probably the most flexible uh, champagne because you can have it as an aperitif. It has beautiful freshness. You can go with a uh, with a first course, let's say a salmon tartar, or for instance, it works quite well. You can go with some delicate uh, meat. You know, um, I, I love it with a. With Peking duck, believe it or not, it's it's one of the most magical match I think with this uh, with this rosé. Um, maybe a bit tougher with cheese, uh, but it it also works extremely extremely well as you can as you can imagine with like uh, the berry when it's the season, but also uh, with um, like dark citrus fruit. Uh, think of like a, a ruby grapefruit uh, mm -hmm. during during the winter season. It's important okay. to taste the fruits when when they are at their best. So 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 the seasonality is something important. But pretty much all three of these wines is kind of all you need for a meal <laughs> because you can start out with an imperative and move to a cheese plate and then a peking duck and you are all set so um good reflection i know that sustainability is, has been important for ruinar can you touch on that just a little bit um about that identity for ruinar well it's obviously and, and and thankfully it's not only for ruinar i think the champagne okay. region has been yeah. fully engaged you know uh, uh since the uh, late 90s. So it's nothing new for us. You know, we see, okay. we see the change happening in the vineyards. We see uh, harvest becoming sooner and sooner, having uh, warmer and warmer uh, vintages in a way. And, and, and I think we, we've uh, realized that we, uh, the region needs to be uh, exemplary in a way. And, and, and we, uh, we have to make our best efforts to, uh, to uh, uh, keep the nature, keep the environment the way it is. And, uh, but, we need to address different topics. And, and quite often people think about only viticulture and, and winemaking. But if you, if you look at the, uh, the carbon footprint um, of our business, uh, viticulture and, and winemaking are not that um, important in percentage. You know, they might represent 10, 15%. A lot of the uh, uh, environmental impact coming from uh, what we do in Champagne comes from packaging and transportation. Um, an example about transportation, we've stopped shipping anything by plane for now nearly 10 years. This is, it's becoming like, we don't do it. We just want to do it, don't want to do it because we know the impact is greater. So like wines coming to the, going to the US uh, is, is entirely by boat. And, and, I, and it's the same for uh, my colleagues over there, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of packaging, 
uh, you know, decreasing the weight of packaging, uh, recycling it is also extremely important. And, and I want to show you an innovation that will be coming to the US next spring. Uh, this will actually completely replace uh, the, uh, the former gift box. It's called the second skin. It just wraps the bottle like this. It's quite beautiful. Uh, it has a nice uh, touch, almost like chalk. But more importantly, it's nine times lighter than the previous gift box. It uh, emits 60% less green gases, you know, the production of it and the shipping of it. So, so by doing this kind of effort in packaging, uh, uh, you know, you have a very strong impact on your, uh, on your, uh, on your environmental uh, print in a way. So, you know, another, another example that will be uh, um, going on soon here at Renard, and we, we, I'm part of, I mean, I'm inside now a, a, an historical building and uh, next spring, there will be some solar panels. And this is something that could not be even imagined 10 years ago because it's a classified monument and, and no one could think that you could put solar panels. But I think the, uh, even the administration is changing and, and these solar panels will provide us nearly 10% uh, of our uh, energy needs. So, yeah. you know, all, all effort counts uh, in that matter. And, uh, and at the end, uh, we hope that these small creeks will make a big river. Yeah, small, small steps. Um, that kind of leads into my final question I was going to ask each of you, because obviously we are in Champagne, which is so seeped in history with so many stories from uh, centuries ago, but you know we're gonna keep moving forward in the future. So what is the most exciting thing, I guess, you are seeing, I mean, you have the second skin, so either exciting or evolving thing that you see happening in Champagne right now, whether or not it's as a region or, or with your own house. And Benoit, I was going to, to throw that to you first. Uh, um, I think the, the DNA of Moëté Chandon is really about balancing uh, what I like to call authenticity and contemporaneity. Uh, some people call it tradition and modernity, but I think uh, tradition is often misused. Uh, for many people, it means uh, being stuck in the past. It's not our spirit. Our spirit is uh, really about being authentic, the idea of being uh, uh, rooted um, with our vineyards, with our patrimony, with our history, with our legacy. So uh, we are rooted, but we live with our time. And I believe uh, we have to continue to do so. We have to continue to evolve. Um, there is no need to revolution, but there is a need to constant evolution. We have to adapt. We have to feel the, um, uh, the, 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 the time and uh, consumer expectations and so. And there are different directions. Um, I think uh, in the past few years, we have seen uh, a new life for sweeter style of champagne, demi-sec, nectar imperial, uh, ice imperial on ice that, are, that, that have been very uh, useful to not only energize the brand, but also to recruit, to attract new consumers uh, to the champagne category. And on the other hand, uh, in the more classic uh, brut category, we, we've seen a, a, a wish, uh, une envie of the consumers to go to a, a lighter style, a lower in dosage and so. So we work in both directions. I don't think there is not one truth. Uh, champagne is diverse. Champagne is a diamond. And uh, the three of us, uh, with Moëté Chandon, with Veuve Clicquot, with Rinard, and all our colleagues uh, within the Champagne Appellation uh, are different facets of the Champagne diamonds. And we have to polish the different, uh, the different facets of the champagne diamonds and we have to promote the diversity of champagne because I st strongly believe that champagne is maybe the most diverse uh, region when it comes to um, uh, wine styles. And uh, often people think you have one kind of champagne, you have many kinds of champagne and it's something you still have to discover. Yeah, so we will keep encouraging that discovery. Um, DDA, what about you? Anything you're seeing kind of coming up future for what else to add after Benoit um, means I'm not from Champagne I discovered Champagne 25 years ago uh, and for me it was really like just to understand that Champagne is a wine first 
Um, and I, I have this souvenir of tasting old vintages of champagne, and that's an amazing moment. Uh, because champagne, in fact, has a huge uh, potential of aging uh, because of the, of the sparking, finally. Um, we, have, we have, in fact, by uh, creating uh, our wine, the blend, we are, uh, in, our inspiration comes from the history of, of the house, of the history of, of the region. And we have to create uh, also by thinking about the future. Uh, and, and the world is changing very fast, much faster than before. So, uh, when you are when you are creating a vintage like today, uh, you have to imagine that that vintage will be uh, drinking in, in five, seven years, or even ten years for La Grande Dame. So you have to imagine in ten years what will be the taste of the people. Mm -hmm. And what I love in that job is the present doesn't exist. We use the, the, the past to create the future. Uh, it's not easy uh, because the world is changing. We have, uh, we have to be more sustainable. We have to take care of the vineyard. But our pleasure is about wine, is about winemaking, is about offering a pleasure to people by drinking a glass of champagne. And that's the most exciting part of my job. And it is exciting to drink a glass of champagne or, or three, which I'm privileged to do. So, um, Frederic, you touched on this a little bit, but is there anything you'd like to add on, on that with the, your sustainability going forward? Well, I, I could not agree more with, uh, with Benoit and, and Didier when it comes to the, the diversity of champagne. And I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, people used to see champagne as the one of celebration and more and more you see the different styles you see houses, you see growers, um, obviously us, we are also innovating and, and there will be more innovation come in, in the coming years for sure. And I think that's very exciting. And you see a lot of critics, a lot of, um, a lot of people like you guys, um, a lot of consumers finding that champagne is an amazing wine, that it can eat, that it can go with food. And, uh, and, and, but it also has that, you know, I think champagne, sometimes people ask you, do I need a special moment to drink champagne? And, and, and our answer is always no. Champagne will make your moment special. And, yeah. and this will always stay, no matter what. Um, and you know what? As I was born and raised in Champagne, unlike, unlike my friends here. And so let's cheer to that. Well, cheers. And thank you so much. For the... And I love that. Yes, the, your special moment is drinking the champagne, which is, which is perfect. Absolutely. But Thank you so much for being here to tell your stories and share your incredible wine. Um, thank you to those of you who have joined us. Um, I hope you learned something about champagne, but also enjoyed tasting um, these delicious wines. Uh, the trio is still available on wine.com. Yes, they make great gifts because there's these cute little half bottles, but even better to keep for yourself and, and taste these iconic uh, styles from these beautiful, beautiful place that I'm I can't wait to visit again. So again, Benoit, Didier, Frédéric, um, salut, santé, merci. Thank you for joining us. Cheers. Merci. Cheers. Merci. Cheers. It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice, and now our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com, seriously passionate about wine. Download our free app today.